We had to do lots of calculations, and we did them on Martian calculating machines. By the way, just to give you an idea what Los Alamos was like, we had these Marchant computers. I don't know if you know what they look like. Hand calculated with numbers, and you push them, and they multiply, divide, add, and so on. Not like they do easy now, but hard. They were mechanical gadgets. And they had to be sent back to the factory to be repaired. We didn't have a special man to do it, and that was the standard way to do it. And so they were always being sent to the factory, and pretty soon you were running out of machines. So I and a few other fellows started to take the covers off. We weren't supposed to. There's a rule. You take the covers off, we cannot be responsible. So we took the covers off. <laughs> We had a nice series of lessons, like the first one we took the cover off for, there was a shaft with a hole in it and a spring which was hanging this way, and obviously the spring went in the hole, so it was easy. So we got like a series of lessons by God on how to fix them, and we got better and better, and we did more and more elaborate repairs. When we got something too complicated, we sent it out back to the factory, but we would do the easy ones and kept the things going. Uh, I also did some typewriters. I ended up doing all the computers. The other fellas quit on me. I did a few typewriters, but there was a guy in the machine shop who was better than I was, and he took care of typewriters, I took care of any machines. <laughs> However, we decided that the big problem, which was to figure out exactly what happened during the bomb's explosion, when you push the stuff in by an explosion and then it goes out again, exactly what happened so we could figure out how much energy was released and so on, required much more calculating than we were capable of. And a rather clever fellow by the name of Stanley Frankel, realized that it possibly could be done on IBM machines. The IBM company had machines for business purposes, which were adding machines that called tabulators for listing sums, and multiplier, just a machine, big machine. You put cards in, and it would take two numbers from a card and multiply and print it on the card. And then there were collators and sorters and so on. So he figured out a nice program. If we got enough of these machines in a room, we could take the cards and put them through a cycle. Everybody who does numerical calculation now knows exactly what I'm talking about. But this is kind of a new thing, mass production with machines. Uh, we had done things like this on adding machines. Usually you would go one step across yourself doing everything. But this was different. We'd go first to the adder, then we go to the multiplier, then we go to the adder and so on. So he designed this thing and ordered the machines from the IBM company. We realized it was a good way of solving our problems, and we found that there was somebody in the Army that had IBM training. We needed a man to repair them, to keep them going and everything, and they were going to send this fellow, but it was delayed, always delayed. Now, we always were in a hurry. I have to explain that. We, everything we did, we tried to do as quickly as possible. So in this particular case, we worked out all the numerical steps that the machines were supposed to do, multiply this and then do this and subtract that. No, we worked out the program, but we didn't have any machines to test it on. So what we did, is we, all I arranged was a room with girls in it. Each one had a Martian, but she was the multiplier, and she was the heir, and this one cubed, so we, and then we had cards, index cards. All she did was cube this number and send it to the next one. She was imitating the multiplier, the next one was imitating the heir, and we went through our cycle, and we got all the bugs out. Well, we did it that way, and it turned out that the speed at which we were able to do it, we'd never done mass production calculate. Everybody who ever calculated before, a single person did all the steps, but it's, Ford had a good idea. The damn thing works a hell of a lot faster the other way. And we got speed with this system that was the predicted speed for the IBM machines, the same. <laughs> the only difference is that the IBM machines didn't get tired and could work three shifts, but the girls got tired after a while. So anyway, we got the bugs out during that process, and finally the machines arrived, but not the repairman. So, we went down to put them together. And one of the most complicated machines of technology of those days, these computing machines, the big thing, they came partially disassembled with lots of wires and blueprints of what to do. We went down and we put them together, Stan Frankel and I and another fellow. And uh, we had our trouble. Most of the trouble was the big shots coming all the time and saying, you're going to break something, you're going to break something. <laughs> we put them together and sometimes they would work. And sometimes they were put together wrong and they didn't work. So he fiddled around and they got it to work. We didn't get them all to work. And I was at last working on some multiplier. I saw a bent part inside, but I was afraid to straighten it because it might snap off. And they were always telling us we're going to bust it irreversibly. And finally, the man from the IBM company came in time, as a matter of fact, according to schedule. But he came and he fixed the rest that we hadn't got ready and everything was going. We got the program going, but he had trouble with the one that I had trouble with and I couldn't fix. So after three days, he was still working on that one last one. I went down and said, oh, I noticed that, that was bent. Oh, he says, of course, he's, that's all there is to it. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> so that was it. Well, Mr. Frankel started this program, 
and began to suffer from a disease, the computer disease that anybody who works with computers now knows about. It's a very serious disease, and it interferes completely with the work. It was a serious problem we were trying to do. The disease with computers is you play with them. <laughs> They're so wonderful. You have these X switches that determine if it's an even number, you do this, and if it's an odd number, you do that. And pretty soon, you can do more and more elaborate things if you're clever enough on one machine. And so after a while, it turned out the whole system broke down. He wasn't paying any attention. He wasn't supervising anybody. The system was going very, very slowly, the real problem. Well, he was sitting in a room figuring out how to make one tabulator automatically print arctangent x. And then it would start and print columns and then and calculate the arctangent automatically by integrating as it went along and make the whole table in one operation. Absolutely useless. We had tables of arctangent. <laughs> But if you've ever worked with computers, you understand the disease. The delight to be able to see how much you can do. But he got the disease for the first time. The poor fellow who invented the thing got the disease. And so I was asked to stop working on the stuff I was doing in my group and to go down and to take over the IBM group. And so I noticed the disease and I tried to avoid the disease. And uh, although they did three problems in nine months, I had a very good group. They had selected all over the country a thing called special engineer detachment. Clever boys from high school to go into the army who had engineering ability, and they collected them together, special engineer detachment, they sent them up to Los Alamos. They put them in barracks, and they would tell them nothing. Then they came to work, and what they had to do was work on IBM machines, punching holes, numbers that they didn't understand. Nobody told them what it was. The thing was going very slowly. I said that the first thing has to be is that the technical guys know what we're doing. So Oppenheimer went and talked to the security and got special permission, so I had a nice lecture, which I told them what we're doing. They were all excited. We're fighting a war. We see what it is. They knew what the numbers meant. If the pressure came out higher, that meant it was more energy release, and, was, and so on and so on. They knew what they were doing. Complete transformation. They began to invent ways of doing it better. They improved the scheme. They worked at night. They didn't need supervisors in the night. They didn't need anything. They understood everything. They invented several of the programs that were used and so forth. So my boys really came through, and all they had to be done was to tell them what it was. That's all. They just not tell them they're punching holes, please. As a result, although it took them nine months to do three problems before, we did nine problems in three months, nearly ten times as fast. But one of the secret ways that we did our problems was this. The problem consisted of a bunch of cards which had to go through a cycle, first add, then multiply, and so it went through the cycle of machines in this room, slowly about, as it went around and around. So we figured a way, by taking a different colored set of cards, to put them through a cycle too, but out of phase. We'd do two or three problems at a time. See, this was another problem. But while this one was adding, that was multiplying on the other problem. And such managerial schemes, <laughs> we got many more problems. Finally, near the end of the war, just before we had to make a test in Albuquerque, the question was, how much would we release? We had been calculating the release from various designs. But the specific design, which was ultimately used, we hadn't computed. So Bob Christie came down and said, we would like the result for how this thing is going to work in one month or some very short time, less than that, three weeks. I said, it's impossible. But he says, look, you're putting out so and so many problems a month. It takes only two, three weeks per problem. I said, I know. It takes much longer to do the problem, but we're doing them in parallel. If they go through, it takes a long time, and there's no way to make it go around faster. So he went out, and I began to think, is there a way to make it go around faster? Well, if we did nothing else on the machine, so there was nothing interfering, and so on, so on, I began to think. I put on the blackboard a challenge. Can we do it to the boys? They all start to, yes, we'll work double shift. We'll work overtime. We'll try it. We'll try it. And so the rule was all of the problems out. No only one problem, and just concentrate on this thing and so forth. So they started to work, and my wife died in Albuquerque. And I had to go down. I borrowed Fuchs' car. He was a friend of mine in the dormitory. He had an automobile. He was using the automobile to take the secrets away, you know, of Santa Fe. He was the spy. I didn't know that. I borrowed his car to go to Albuquerque. The damn thing got three flat tires on the way. <laughs> I came back from there, and I went into the room. Well, I was supposed to be supervising everything, but I couldn't do it for three days, and it was in this mess, this big rush to get the answer for the test that was going to be done in the desert. I go into the room, and there are three different color cards. There's white cards, there's blue cards, there's yellow cards. And I start to say, but you're not supposed to do more than one problem. Only one problem. They said, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> Wait, we'll explain everything. So I waited. And what happened was this. As they went through, sometimes the machine made a mistake or they put a wrong number in. What we used to have to do, we would find something to go back and do that over again. 
But they notice this, that there's a deck of cards representing positions in depth in space of something. And the mistake made here in one cycle only affects the nearby numbers. The next cycle affects the nearby numbers and so on. So it only works its way through the pack of cards. You have 50 cards, you make a mistake at card number 39, it affects 37, 38, and 39 the next time, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40, the next time it spreads like a disease, the error. So they found an error back a ways, and they got an idea. They would only compute a small deck of 10 cards around the error. And because 10 cards could be put through the machines faster than the deck of 50 cards, they would go with this other deck rapidly through while they continued with the 50 cards with the disease spreading. But the other thing was computing faster, and they would seal it all up and correct it. OK? Very clever. That was the way those guys worked. Really hard, very clever to get speed. There's no other way. If they had stopped to try to fix it, we'd have lost our time. We couldn't have got it resolved. That's what they were doing. Of course, you know what happened while they were doing that. They found an error in the blue deck. And so they had a yellow deck <laughs> with fewer cards. It was going around faster. And the blue deck was going, and just when they're going crazy, you know, because after they get it straight now, they've got to fix the white one. They've got to take the other cards out and replace it by the right ones and continue correctly. And it's rather confusing you know, how those things always are. You don't want to make a mistake. And just at the time when they got these three decks going, they're trying to seal everything else, the boss comes walking in. <laughs> Leave us alone, they said. So I left them alone, and everything came out. We solved the problem in time, and uh, that's the way it worked. Word.